Welcome back to the shop today. Guaranteed to be a gooder. This is not a guarantee. We are going to check out the DeWilt cordless compressor. Uh, the build quality as well as uh, check the veracity of their performance claims. Like many of you, I mightn't have been born in the dark, but I wasn't born last night. So we're going to have a look-see at what kind of performance tickets this thing is showing. 1.2 uh cfm at 90 pissies and 1.5 cfm at with a uh, across there and that is saying oh look at this hey it's a step in the right direction it says here it's been tested per iso uh, international standards organization 127 uh, 17 uh, uh there should be a date on there as well to see when the last standards were updated but very likely that was recently i think it's every five years so that would mean that they've gone ahead and and this is a good thing that they've gone ahead and codified testing procedures so that would that sort of levels the playing field now, i'm not so naive to actually believe any of this bullshit because you know it, it, here's the thing there's so much marketing wank on a lot of these tools that they, they don't realize that they're debasing their brand by by bullshitting. And so they gotta they gotta hire shills in order to say this is the best tool. That, this and they're gonna be wrong here. I'm ranting, but shills fucking love me, especially the review shill sites because they get hired when I piss somebody off. They get hired to do a contrary view, so they'll ramble on and void a care about what a goof i am a fair play to them but realistically they fucking love it because they're getting that filthy filthy lucre for uh getting down on their knees and bowing down to the corpo type so in this case if we had all of these tool organizations follow this standard then we would have a baseline as to whether uh, you know, basic performance rather than just relying on what's on the box. So this would entail, I'm guessing here, I'm, I'm not about to go to the ISO site uh, and, and buy a $200 pamphleteer, 12 pamphlet, uh, indicating the test procedure, but very likely they're controlling inlet temperature, the altitude, that is the density of the air, probably what gas they're using because they could use a very light gas or a very heavy gas depending on what kind of targets they wanted to hit you know there's all kinds of fluffery digressions aside and getting back to the countenance of the closure here made in the us and a with global materials none of these skip uh, data points look off kilter at all 130 uh that might be a little bit i i, I got a feeling a compressor is going to be louder than that uh, 0.4 horsepower uh, that sounds about right 21 pounds yeah and the difference uh, that's about right uh, <laughs> not for lifting what the fuck is a handhold for if it's not for lifting for frog snacks people mean what you say and say what you mean you got a handhold here it is clearly for fucking lifting you're you're shooting yourself in the foot by sticking on this cover your assery so she come with a battery charge air, sacrifice to the garbage can, and no plastic. Oh, sorry about that. I whacked you right in the microphone. Wow, oh, wait, wait, wait. This might have been, uh, some bastard might have used this and then brought her back. Let's have a look. Oh, hey, look at that. It's brand spanking. You can still see the fibers of the cardboard on, the, on here. So this is brand new. My mistake, mouth got ahead of me. As is my want. She beat all the fuck, used it on the plastique. Now you can do whatever the fuck you want, but when we all agree to never speak of something again, I stick to it. It's a bit of an ungodly gob of dinosaur squeezing. It's no glass fiber reinforcing in there, and it doesn't feel like nylon. It doesn't make sense, really, that this would be nylon. It's a big part, right? So we see it's been injected here that's funny on the front face that they injected it where you can see it a little tit there my ocd is showing not that i really have ocd but some things trick you know you know we all have our weaknesses and i bet you there's another one under here yeah there we go there's a little pip there for where the uh hot 
Shmoo got squoze in. I don't see any recycling. Oh, here we go. The recycling mark is polypropylene. The mold is in real good shape. This is a low, probably a very low volume uh, injection mold. You can see some hand polishing here. Lots of injection, uh, ejection pins. Stiff. The black is a little bit washed out. Again, it's tough. It's expensive to dye something perfectly black or red or, you know, there's certain colors that aren't conducive to having a deep, rich color unless you uh, really whop the dollar dues to the dye supplier. And in this case, it's a little bit washed out, but nothing serious. The feet... A very soft durometer considering this is on a compressor. I don't think they put much thought into that. That's quite soft. Um, off the shelf part made by Ebco, Ebco 47. And then they haven't, they've, they haven't put much meat in here. So there's not enough meat to screw into to have it affixed properly. There's enough meat to support the weight, of course. It's actually very rigid. But they've added these automotive body style things. Uh, these are a pain in the cunning linguals. You ever get some damn, uh, you know, some ducting under your car. Uh, all that stuff flapping in the breeze because of these stripping right out uh, instantaneously. First time you use them. Kind of a pain in the arse. In this case though, eh, why would you ever take these off? Now we got both sides apart. We can see what was holding the pressure vessel. Remember kids, we do not fuck with pressure vessels this is an interesting case study in manufacturing you can see this has been uh progressively uh, formed you can see some lines some striations here where it was in the die and then it looks like this was robotically welded around the periphery and then manually welded for the feet we have some cratering we have some pinholes a pretty craptacular job. It's only welded on the one side, of course, so that's not particularly strong. However, what's going to break first? Two, two kind of half-ass stitch welds or the plastique? Uh, that's one of those things, right? Uh, there's going to be a bottleneck what breaks somewhere. Which one's it going to be? I would prefer to see the plastique break before a weld on a pressure vessel. Now this, I'm getting excited here because this is a beautiful specimen. They make these by the gazillions. It's a beautiful specimen to show the cheapest way to make a pressure vessel. Now on the back side here, what they've done is they've come in through the top. So this wouldn't be welded together. They've come in through the top with a friction drill. Now, being human ain't easy. You know, ladies get to a certain age and uh, they need a little extra. These kind of friction drills are titanium carbon. Oh my fuck. Constained tongue glide. I got tongue tangulated there. I don't know. I'm thinking about ladies in uh, the Sahara Desert. So what happens is these actually uh, create enough friction to melt a localized area and punch through. I've done Vigeos on this. You remember I stuck my dingus end in there and didn't pull her out in time. That's what happens. Bites it right off. So this came in from the backside and then uh, form a form tap in order to get whatever that is, one eighth or one quarter national fine tap in there and let's see if there's any residual yeah there is some residual pressure just a little a little whiff of a fart left in there it might be a uh, pressure differential and then on the front side here also super interesting because we've got the same thing we've got the friction drill but from this side so it came in from this way probably after it was welded so we might even see some crap in the tank but i don't hear anything maybe um Maybe they wash it out. But you can see they came in here this way. And they came in with a tool what doesn't roll it over but actually cuts it. It looks just like this. Only it's got a square cutter bit on it in order to take that flashing off. But they don't go all the way down to take all the flashing off. There's still this Widowmaker on here. And this guy, this is the actual tool what they'd use. A little bit bigger. Probably the 3 8 the actual tool, what they'd used, and it makes that nice rolled over edge. Of course, all this does is it allows you to take sheet metal 
And then as you're friction drilling, it makes the hole longer. Well, you see, it makes the hole longer so that you can actually seal up some pressure in there, of course, because, well, I'll show you because why. Best way to seal this and most expensive way to seal these holes is a doughty seal. That's a BSP, British Standard Pipe Thread, straight with a backed washer. So that's a sealing washer, but it also has some steel, so you cannot extrude that, that seal. Also, the nice thing about this in maintenance application is if it's weeping, you can give her a little extra turn and that might save you a lot of headache. There's other, there's other ones that use an O-ring. So this is an O-ring boss, same thing, but then instead of having a flat for this to seal against, you actually need a bit of a chamfer so that, uh, so that the O-ring has somewhere to uh, seal up against. Again, this is a good one, but it's not backed and you can sometimes cheat and give her a little extra turn. That seals it up. Of course, the other end of that is uh, JIC, Joint International Committee. This is a really good seal, but it's a metal on metal seal. So what happens is it'll start to leak a little bit. You'll tighten it up. It'll start to leak again because of heat cycling or whatever. These are really good seals for maintenance, but they do crack the female nut if you give her too much. And there's spork, there's spork texts and so forth, torque checks and so forth. But um None of this is applicable to a consumer grade low pressure system. Of course, what we get is the ubiquitous and cheap national pipe thread. If you look at that, that's on a wedge. That pipe thread is a wedge. So you stick it in there and it actually wedges itself in. The problem, of course, is the root of this thread is a spiral leakage path. So in order for this not to leak, you got to actually put some proper schmoo in the base of those threads so that you don't have a spiral leakage pass. And that schmoo, a lot of times, grease will do it because it's, it's viscous enough so that the air can't push through. But on air fittings, I actually prefer to use the Teflon tape, the PTFE. And I like this stuff. The, this is the, uh, the petrochemical one. This is the, the super thick good stuff. It seems to stay sealed even in heat cycling if you really want to seal one of these good and proper like say you're using a, a high pressure uh hydraulic system and you're getting weeping and there's vibration there of course you have that spiral leakage this is the worst sealing system but it's cheap so people we're stuck with it it is fucking terrible because it's got a built-in leakage path but what you can do you heat this up to about 300 dungarees Frankenstein. That opens up the hole. Then you whop this in there at room temperature. Then when she chills down, it's tighter than a nun. Ah, what the fuck? I'm in a talkative mood. Getting back to her. We got two uh, ports here, an inlet and an outlet. Which one's the inlet? I would venture to say, if I just had to guess, the smaller one would be the inlet. And then when you want a lot of flow, you come through the outlet. But... The fitting, the fitting is indicative. That's a check valve. That check valve means that on the other end of this guy eh, is the la bomba. So the pump pumps in and then checks into here. Here's your drain cock. And then there's your outlet, just a quarter inch hole, tiny little quarter inch hose. Now you're not going to get much flow out of this, but that's not what this is for. This is for running a... Uh, you know, a little nail gun or a stapler for doing crown molding and stuff, maybe filling up the tires on your kid's bike, that sort of thing. In general, compressors are built like a shit brick house. In this case, meh, not so much. Pretty light duty, as witnessed by just this rubber core. This will harden and crack after a time. On the outlet, of course, you take a, a gas, you compress it. It takes all that the thermosity in there. It gets hotter. It gets hotter. So that's part of the reason why air compressor systems are so inefficient. They're incredibly inefficient. The, the power in, you only get about 10% of that power out at the tool because you are compressing that air. It's hot. Now it sits in the tank and it gets cool. So you're losing that heat energy. And the steel tubing, it might even be aluminum. I gotta get it off. 
it's it would be drawn over mandrel it would be seamless tubing so it keeps a real good nominal or a, a real good dimensional st uh, tolerance let's say struggling for that word but drawn over mandrel essentially it's seamless normally pipe what they do is they roll a section and weld it together so you see if you look in any kind of pipe or hollow structural steel tubing it'll have a weld line in there and that's also why you can't just go and buy two inch square tubing and expect it to fit into two and a half inch square tubing because there's a jesus weld all the way around down there there's no weld in these guys because they're drawn over mandrel so on the inside as they're as they're being pushed out hot through the die there's also an internal die and it gets drawn over that mandrel so that you don't have to roll it and weld it it's it's one piece i guess the pipe is one piece too but it's also it's it's welded yeah so that's just aluminium extruded uh drawn to to length probably coiled up at the fact you know and and sent to whoever has the bending machine to robotically bend these nip these off it either looks out of magic or possibly somebody doing it with a with a uh, scoring tool not d bird at all there's a big uh, there's a big rolled over edge there might get rid of that just for perspicacity's sake might that's a verbal cut that's like maybe ever know what it is yeah somebody asks you to go on a four-hour bike ride and you say yeah maybe let's talk about it that means no no i recognize that now in other people somebody somebody tells me no or somebody tells me maybe 99 percent of the time it's gonna be no they're just trying to spare my feelings which is odd because most of my best friends hate me I've got the handle off here. No markings on her, but it feels different. I suspect this is glass fiber reinforced nylon. Let's have a listen here. No, no glass fiber in there. Maybe it is polypropylene. I would fire up, well, but for two problems. One, the old smelloscope isn't in here. I don't have the... Uh, I don't have the soldering iron. And two, I'm just getting over a week long a headache. I fingered for sure I had a full frontal lobe tumor of some sort. That would explain some odd behaviors, definitely. But yeah, that might be PP. It feels a little different though. And if you look at it, it does have a different tone to the black I, uh, I, uh, I have to switch in here I don't want to bust anything although pretty tough to make an egg without busting a few omelets sorry I keep dingling your microphone there huh it's like that's the switch assembly. I might try and get... Oh, there's some tabs as well as fasteners. These are a pain in the ears. What the fuck, over? You got every, <laughs> every swing and dick. He's like a punguishin. Every swing and dick on the claim. I got a... Oh, you sneaky little minx. Bet you there's something behind here. You... Aha! There ya go. Not so fucking tough now, are ya? <laughs> All right, we're in like saying we got a splayed out here. We can see what's going on. Wait a second. Not there. Is this? That's. A, oh yeah, shit! Look, it even says so on the box. It's uh, this is a brushless. Well, all right. Here's the. Oh no, no. Oh. They put electric vinyl black tape on there. I like chickens tape. That slimy old curse. Yeah, uh, kind of muck bound here, so I gotta start cutting stuff off and hoping for the beast. I hope I got some of those pex clampy things. 
We're in a little better shape now. At least we can get in there. Here's the outlet manifold with the gauge and the pressure switch. This would turn off once you reach a set pressure. And if you go over that pressure, you get the blow off valve here, which opens up. Or if you want to just bleed it down quick, you can pull this open. This is a pop it valve. It's a spring loaded valve. And when the pressure on the back side equals or overcomes the spring pressure, pops off, lets the air out. You see, these are all accredited the pressure vessel. This relief valve, emergency relief, has that little, what would you call that? Four leaf clovery kind of Maltese cross. Or no, not a Maltese cross. Maltese cross is eight pointed. A lot of guys, uh, like, you know, how firefighters have the, have the cross in order to protect them from Greek fire, from uh, Malta, the Crusaders, and so forth. Well, that Maltese cross is actually eight-pointed. And the cross that the firefighters use is another cross. It's a saint. Oh, there's a saint. And I forgot the story about the saint, so I can't remember. But it's not a Maltese cross. Which brings me to this thing. Normally on a pressure vessel, especially one sold in Norte America, there would be that symbol or a tag welded on there that it has been tested and it is accredited for use as a pressure vessel. That this does not have it is rather disconcerting. So is it because it's consumer grade it doesn't have there or they're, they're accrediting it themselves? Or you or putting a UL stamp on there, or I know these ones from the Power Fister, which is the Cambodian version of uh, the Hazard Fart. These don't have anything at all on them. It just, I guess you're taking your life in your hands, or I don't know what the litigious situation would be if and one of these exploded on you, whether they'd be, I, I, I have no idea. That's why I'm asking. So here we got the switch and horror of horrors, as I said, Elec Chickens tape. Just the bane, yeah, pretty chintzy there. This thing, you know, it's not, it doesn't appear to be built for extreme longevity. It, it is not built like a regular compressor. It's built like a, a short-term use compressor, in, in my opinion. You look at this now, the switch, big inductive kickback diode, the snubber diode. So what this does, you know, you got the ESC driving the motor. You got a lot of current going through there. And all the current comes from the batteria, goes through the switch. You cut that off dead. And now you got all that current, what was flowing. And you get essentially water hammer. Just like in, in a hose, you close the spigot too quick. You get a water hammer, the pressure spikes. Well, in this case, the pressure is voltage, the voltage spikes. So what we do is we add an, a, a diode in the wrong direction. And that allows that... Uh, voltage spike to dissipate backwards across that diode and smooths everything out. If ever you see an inductor, you know, one of these blown out, say in a, a DC contactor or like a forklift, you know, something, a very high current device and it's blown right out of her and the thing still works. And you think to yourself, well, why the fuck is that even in there? It's just a, a waste of money to put a new one in because it'll just blow and it doesn't do anything. It does do something. What it does is it saves the contacts from uh, arcing out extremely because now instead of having a volt, uh, a thousand volts as the contact separates, it has 48 volts or 50 volts what they're coming from the battery and the rest goes through the diode. But these are a wearing item. They do blow up eventually so you don't want to discount just because the thing still works and you got the shit stain let out of an electrical component doesn't mean it wasn't there for no reason and this is a pain in the air so we've never seen this before they've actually got rue rings here rings and you have to feed you got to take the leads off of the and feed them right through i guess we could cut those not gonna make any never mind them oh maybe not maybe i'm full oh no they're just hooks Fucking guy's blind. Needs some glaucoma medication, apparently. So we'll get that out of there. Now, the interesting thing about this is, because it's a three-phase motor, recall that me and the Duclaw, we put a VFD to make a cordless compressor, a variable frequency dive, three-phase on a three-phase motor, and that would allow us to do certain things like um, 
ramp up and ramp down and have idle pressure and also you could send signals to the thing you know if you wanted higher demand you could maybe blip the trigger three times the esc would read that and 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 have it run continuous and then instead of cycling on and off okay the beautiful thing about this which is obviously not implemented because people don't think that far ahead but in future iterations it'd be beautiful to see some of all this highfalutin technology and actually use the Jesus thing in a way that helps people so that you know you're you're up uh, doing crown molding and you're not waiting for the thing to cycle on and off or you don't have to fire a few uh, blanks so that you can actually get the thing to drop enough pressure so it kicks on again you know a sort of a smart on-demand compressor and they'll be able to do that with this controller because this controller is a three-phase controller there'll be a brain box in here all kinds of magicry they could do so in the coming years i would suspect that they would start getting away from this dumb control mode of cha-chunk, ka-chunk. Uh, you know, that 150 years in the past, that's the way they did it because there was contacts and there was just a pressure switch. But in this case, they could send a pressure transducer signal and it could extrapolate with a PID control whether or not you want uh, more flow you could overspeed the engine you could do uh, overspeed this you could do all sorts of interesting things with this smart control unfortunately in this case uh it's not implemented but man one hell of a competitive advantage to whatever company comes out with that now this brushless motor controller undoubtedly has a brain box in there potted right in solid got a couple of chintzy kind of half-assed heat sinks in there but lots of signaling and we see two go to the pressure switch there's two on the main switch as well as the power from the battery uh, there's a whole bunch of signaling from the battery probably give you a temperature and maybe some balancing also this will run on 60 volts so there's also some signaling to tell it what kind of battery it's compatible with 20 volts 60 volts all kind of volts so, and then going up to the three phases of the brushless DC motor and the Hall effect sensors sense the position of the rotor feeding back into the ESC here. Here we got a tie rod cylinder, the cheapest kind of cylinder you can make. There's just, again, uh, drawn over mandrel hose tubing with a gland end. Here we have the reed valve in there. And another reed valve. Now we'll have a look at the piston. For the for first the cylinder, not particularly inspiring, it's comforting. You see, they they they're going for that wear in mechanism, the self polishing mechanism. Uh, a lot of schmoo in there. You see, it hasn't got much stroke at all on her, but five eighths of stroke. It is a reasonably big around. Of course, you can volumetric efficiency being what you could change the stroke on this you could change the size you could do all sorts of things in order to get the same volume out of the pistone but the bigger that this is the better the heat dissipation we see this is just anodized bright aluminium so not particularly good for uh, the, the heat dissipation other than just being aluminium and these components down in here surprisingly not centered metallic but actually uh, cast die cast looks like a nice die casting the crank takes uh, rotary motion and converts it to reciprocating linear motion and we see this is the intake stroke here when the piston comes down this reed valve opens up allows fluid in this case air to get into the cylinder and we have a couple of blocking ports here and that must be some sort of unloader at um bottom dead center that's a very interesting feature what would the purpose of that little hole be at bottom dead center maybe to unload but then i thought there's there's no cooling on this this hot end. and this is this gets hot this is what's doing all the work there is some cooling uh coming from the fan of course uh, some forced air cooling but also this is an air pump so what they're doing is they're trading off some of the the stroke of this guy in order to cool the piston 
and the 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 ring here the uh, cylinder you see what happens you got about this much stroke you're coming you're coming down so you're sucking air in or air is getting pushed in because it's lower pressure in the cylinder and then as you're coming back up until you cover this port and you see there's a fair fair bit of stroke there a fair percentage of stroke where that port is uncovered that is pumping air in and out of this cylinder, effectively cooling it. I see my fear is allayed. One of the worries I had was this entire component would be PP polypropylene because it's no good at heat, softens up real, pro real bad in the heat. But we see some nylon glass fiber reinforced 30%. No, that is not a part number. <laughs> Don't go to the parts counter and demand to have a PA... 66 gf30 or even a gb30 and then offer to come back there and find the part for them they don't take uh, kindly to that we have some foam as well just to mitigate some of the noise entirely unlubricated other than the sealed bearing here there's no lubrication at all on the piston and thoughtfully they've given us an access hole in order to get this off a clever little clamping mechanism in order to not worry about the the tolerancing of these parts of course the tighter the tolerance the more expensive the part so if you can if you can short circuit that by using a clamping mechanism more power to you because it's going to be cheaper for you to, to build you see that that would be tough in a cast a die cast part in order to get that tolerancing for the bearing housing right especially with all the differences in heating you know this hot ended soak in through and it'd be all all kind of different and this is really really smart they've made this essentially idiot proof. of course you make something idiot proof and the world invents a better idiot but you cannot really over torque this because it's solid it's solid so you're just relying on the compression of these two little bits to deform this enough to hold on properly to this big bearing. The piston itself holds some novel, or at least interesting designs. The, the cup, the ceiling cup, metallic with a, it's essentially a DU bushing in a, a special shape. It's got a Teflon coating uh, with a, looks like copper or bronze backing onto a solid steel kind of piston skirt and then as witnessed by these marks, this has been pressed in and fit by these little puncture marks. Of course, that displaces the material and holds everything together. In here, some sort of hardened, it's not aluminium, it must be steel or something probably with quite a bit less thermal conductivity. Try and keep the heat inside the fluid rather than having it soak into the material. Now this is interesting and getting back to while well, the control circuitry you see this is geared one to one it's a it's a shaft right through the middle of this crank weight uh, some handwork gone into this forged crank weight also turned and then uh, deburred all along here just to to lighten it up on the uh where they don't want all the meat you see one to one and this thing is turning it but 3400 ripples which means you could speed the ever living fuck out of this 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 brushless motor would do way more than 3400 ripples what you're constrained by is the thermal the thermal capacity of all the componentry so you definitely if you could get into this black box here, it'd be fuck all to uh, to crank her up under certain conditions. You know, you want a little extra oomph. It's nice and cold outside. You're not too worried about it. But the other thing is, you could have you could have thermal sensors that would throttle it back automatically. I mean, it's it's not right. It's well understood. You just have to make sure that you're not over the thermal capacity of all these little of all these little guys here. And I mean you could get this to run like way more air than it's rated for. One of the interesting things we can do, which will definitely reduce the effective lifetime of this device, is 
plug this little hole. That means instead of wasting that stroke, you're using that, that length of stroke there to get more air. So what I'll do is I'll plug that up, probably just with the right size drill bit, maybe some JB Weld, and then let it set. We'll put it together, measure how much air we're getting, uh, and then we'll go ahead and return this to normal and see how much air we're getting. Sad to say to the JB Weld Corporation, I, I couldn't find, but none of it. So, harken back to my misspent youth making models, see if this is still any good. We gotta be, uh, oh God, possibly 15, 20 years old. I know, making models. Fucking nerd. I don't believe there's any clearance issues and being how oh, this is a tie rod cylinder, shouldn't matter anyway. I'll just jam that in there. Do the old Play-Doh routine. And we've gone long enough. We've been through, uh, we've been through her up and down. We'll let this chooch and then come back to her, test her out in a future video. I appreciate you joining me here in the shop for a laugh. Chuckle and a chortle. Thanks for watching. Ah, keep your dick in a voice.